With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Okay, uh, this may come as a shock to you. Some of you may need to sit down for this, especially those of you out in overflow that couldn't get into the service. Uh, the government might be spying on us again. We're going to go to another one of our Young Voices contributors all the way out in Los Angeles, California. David McGarry, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, thrilled to have you. He's another one of these great Young Voices contributors that we're so proud to partner with. He's written all over the place, American Spectator, other places that you'll notice. This particular place comes out of the center square, though. And just to kind of set it up for us, David, this is not a new thing, but this is kind of a new take on it. Uh, they're going after, in this particular case, things like Western Union. And the bigger problem here is we're going through a third party private entity with the government subpoenas and investigation. This on its surface looks like a hot mess. What did it look like when you started looking into it? Well, the further you dig into it, the hotter the mess gets. The government is forcing these uh, credit transfer businesses like Western Union to provide an incredibly uh, wide set of data to a private entity that basically compiles and holds on to this data for law enforcement agencies across the country to access without any kind of warrant or supervision. Now, is that purposeful? Because it seems odd that they would go through a clearinghouse. I understand on their end while they're doing it. It's nice and easy. Um, but when you get into the numbers here, it looks suspicious to me because I'm not super great at math, David. Help me here. They were going in this particular case with uh, Western Union and Max Transfer, which is um, very popular for like migrants, people like that sending money to Mexico, for example. Uh, but most people would know Western Union, what that is. What they were going after here was they really wanted about eight uh, summonses that they were looking at, but those eight summonses through customs requests, that yielded six million records. Now, that math don't make sense to me. Is that as egregious as it sounds? Because that seems like they really kind of took an inch and went running with a mile here. Well, if anything, it's more egregious than it sounds because these custom summonses, which is the type of subpoena that um, home se Homeland Security Investigations was, was using to uh, gather this uh, to gather this data are explicitly limited to apply to certain types of investigations it is expressly not to be used for bulk data gathering so they are violating their own rules and um although of course the government insists that all of its actions were above board and nothing was done that was wrong all that it took to stop these activities was one letter from senator senator ron wyden of oregon inquiring after this and suddenly, all of this activity was shut down. Now, there, there's sins of omission and commission. Isn't It kind of looks on the, the reason this wasn't illegal is just because nobody thought to write a law about it yet. Is that kind of the take you took on it? And then as soon as they, they if they quit that quick, they knew this was probably shady and we're doing anyway. So, yeah, it's probably not in the letter of the law, but that's just because nobody had actually tried it before. Is that kind of the feel you got with this? Well, I'm not sure about that, to be completely honest, because... There's still a lot that we have to find out. Exactly who at HSI headquarters knew about this and when is still a little bit up in the air. Um, we know for a fact that the agents involved with this behavior were not actually going through the uh, going through the prescribed uh, legal and privacy reviews that they're supposed to complete before they open uh, or before they take these kinds of actions. So. Might it possibly technically technically be in the, within the letter of the law? I doubt it. Small chance. But as I said, they violated their own regulations to get to this point. So it doesn't seem to me as if they're uh, they're uh, acting legally. Yeah, David McGarry joining us from Young Voices. All right, uh, you already mentioned it, so let's talk about it. Uh, Ron Wyden, a uh, senator from Oregon. He's the one that got involved with this. How did he get involved with it? And what was he actually doing that led up to him looking into this? And getting, I, Was it a constituency thing? Was it an investigation thing? How did that happen? So Wyden has actually been very good on these issues of, uh, of privacy um, of late. He 
called out uh, Op Operation Whistle Pig, which was a uh, Border Patrol agent opening an incredibly extensive investigation into a journalist on very flimsy uh, evidence. He called out CIA data gathering earlier this year, and now he's uh, targeting HSI. I mean, the man just cares about an issue that all 99 of his uh, partners in the Senate should also care about. But let's face it, for whatever reason, um, political or otherwise, they don't seem to. But the man's made it a, uh, a priority and part of his uh, part of his political package in his resume. And I think he should be commended for that and support for that, even though there's plenty of his other policies and beliefs that I disagree with. Yeah, and Ron Wyden is a Democrat from Oregon. Oregon, of course, being more of a leftward leaning state, especially the Portland area. Um, is there more bipartisanship on this issue? Because we've been dealing with this since, especially since 9-11. We know about the Patriot stuff. We've been dealing in the last few years with things like FISA warrants and these sorts of things. We've talked on our program a lot about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, you talk about Senator Wyden. Is he alone out there or are there other representatives and senators that you're seeing that maybe get some bipartisan consensus on privacy issues? Because I'm noticing we talk a lot of good game when it comes to big tech and things like that. But then when it's something like this, those same people kind of get quiet. Is that a fair criticism or is other people noticing that as well? No, I think I think that is spot on right there. Um, and I think much of it comes down to the fact that our politics is partisan, not only in a, not only in the ways that that people that the people view themselves, but in the issues that they pick to prioritize. So, like you said, for the left, um, privacy issues and uh, surveillance of citizens has been a really, really big deal for a while. Um, but right now, because it's not a great blunt object to hit Republicans over the head with, it's not actually, um, or I should say the left isn't making uh, Biden administration abuses a priority to combat with the exception of Wyden. Um, with that said, I'm a little bit surprised to be honest that the Republicans aren't jumping on this a little bit more. Under in the Trump administration, conservatives and Republicans and people of the right generally got the idea and started to understand that letting law enforcement agents with all of their biases and personal flaws, uh, letting law enforcement agents go after citizens outside the law probably wasn't the best idea, especially if they if there was no oversight to uh, keep keep them in line. Um, and of course, I'm referring to a lot of the FISA abuse that we saw in um, in relation to the uh, in, in relation to investigations of Trump campaign uh, campaign officials. So why why they can't carry that over and demand that Biden era uh, law enforcement agents follow the law as well? I don't know. I tend to think that it that they're sort of falling back on old style two thousands Tom Cotton esque support for law enforcement and military and surveillance in general, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. Talking to David McGarry about this surveillance program. All right. Uh, when we're talking law enforcement on this particular case, the elephant in the room is DHS. We know what an absolute monster of a government organization this has grown into. And I don't mean that in necessarily a bad way. It's just, it's a monster. It's huge. When they built this thing after 9-11, I don't know that folks really realized how much it was going to change things like law enforcement, like oversight. Where's DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, on this program? Because, like you said, this is a multi-state program. You're also dealing with Mexico because you have a lot of people that come in the country and use these wire transfer companies to send money back to Mexico. Uh, that touches on the immigration issue, which is, of course, in the DHS. What's their role here? Because they have direct oversight from Congress, but they're also so big. We've seen this in hearings time after time after time. It's proven to be an organization that's really hard to do effective oversight on. What's their role in this and where should we start focusing in on because they're so big to get into the heart of the matter on this particular issue? So I think you really hit it on the head, which is that at, at a certain point, if, or I should say in the absence of clear regulations and clear oversight structures, there will be misbehavior when you give any uh, agency or individual this much power over citizens. And actually, that's something that Wyden mentions in his letter, that these custom summons have been abused routinely in the past, that we know this, this has been the subject of inspector general reports, yet for one reason or another, probably because there's not enough institutional incentive to, to make the brass care about it, these reforms have not clearly been implemented throughout the agency. 
We continue our conversation with David McGarry right after this on Hartel. Talking to David McGarry, uh, you you bring up the point that I think is is apropos here is okay. Anytime you're dealing with the legislative branch with Congress, whether it's the senators or the House of uh, Representatives, the only way you really get anybody to do anything is pressure. Um, you talk about it here. Do you see any other way that some of the surveillance stuff is just bringing it to the fore and citizenry having to put pressure on Congress? Because I understand Senator Wyden's taking the lead on this, and God bless him for that. That's one out of that's one out of a hundred, like you pointed out earlier. There's 99 other ones. Uh, what should the citizenry be doing once they find out about an issue like this to kind of bring that pressure to bear? I think this is the classic: call your senators, call your representatives, call uh, call advocacy ad- advocacy groups. Uh, if you're if you're on the fence in an election and 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 one candidate supports um, supports privacy and the protection of privacy. And the other one doesn't, if they seem to otherwise be similar in say a primary or even maybe a general election in certain districts, let that be your um, let that be your defining vote in the absence of other uh, of other important uh, important concerns. I mean, obviously, it's a balance. We, we can't we can't become one issue voters. But at the same time, as citizens, we can um, we can make our voices heard in, you know, on the phone, in emails, in surveys. Opinion polling means a lot these days when it comes to the way that uh these folks run their campaigns. Um, and then for the rest of us um, who are uh, who are maybe involved in some kind of writing or even for 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 citizens who just like to repost things on social media, let's spread the word about this. Let's talk about it. I mean, the, there's no shortage of uh, of news on this front. As I mentioned, we have Operation Whistle Pig, where this uh, rogue border agent was just launching the uh, launching the full powers of multiple different agencies against a reporter because he thought that she might be involved in something unsavory didn't go through any kind of oversight protocols didn't uh <clears throat> didn't follow any kind of uh any kind of process really just decided that he wanted to use the immense power that he had at his disposal to uh to dig through her entire life and he did that on top of that you have like i mentioned before also the widen expose on the CIA's what they call call uh, data queries, where they were gathering quote unquote incidental data on Americans um, because they could, um, or at least they felt that they could. Um, and then now um, Cato uh, is um, is involved in some lawsuits, some FOIA lawsuits, to get the FBI to disclose more information, uh, more more information about these uh, informal, uh, basically investigations. Of course, they don't call them investigations, but basically the FBI has been launching investigations into all sorts of political um, political groups that they perceive to possibly be threats. Uh, and they found a workaround that they feel will allow them to get away with it. And until someone somewhere uh, says something, they'll, they're going to keep doing it. And I think that um, I think that people like Wyden are really uh, are really kicking the ball off, and you know it's our job to support them and spread the word. Let me ask it this way: Has the word privacy gotten too buzzwordy? Have we got to the place where it's 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 not having the impact it should when we talk privacy issues? And maybe we should focus a little more like, you know, this is a law enforcement issue. Like, okay, this is data collection and privacy and a law enforcement issue and separate that from when we're talking about something like big tech, where you're talking about consent agreements and third parties, and it's a little bit different beast. Do you, do you think the buzzword is getting in the way here a little bit where people just hear privacy and they're like, oh, another privacy thing. Should we be more specific in our language when dealing with these issues? Like, look, this is a law enforcement issue. This affects a lot of people. This is a digital copyright issue. This is going to affect you in a different way. Would, would that specificity be helpful here? Because I, I wonder if we're not just making a lot of white noise about um, privacy, and we're kind of losing folks when we're trying to talk about really important issues here. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, like I point out at the end of my piece, spying in the uh, 21st century isn't the sexy cloak and dagger uh, James Bond driving away in a fast car and you know leaving a uh, leaving an explosion behind you. It's someone sitting at a desk 
in some basement office typing in some kind of search query or going through uh, going through filling out the legalese of a subpoena or what have you. These are these are little specific actions that that, like you said, we should be more specific about um, explaining exactly how uh, how certain uh, certain agencies in the government are snooping and spying on on citizens. Um, like like I like a like I was saying before, there's so many examples of these of these abuses, and we have a we have an, an idea of spying or uh, of government surveillance rather as what I call big brotherism. And if you've read 1984, which I assume you have, and a lot of the people listening have as well, um, most of big brother surveillance come from these uh, come from a single method of basically putting cameras in as many rooms as possible. But that's not the way, that's not the way that surveillance works in the real world in the 21st century. It's much more of death by a thousand cuts. Um, there's so many little ways that the federal government has access to your private life and your private details that essentially, if it wants to, for whatever reason that it, that it sees fit, it can indeed intrude on you. David McGarry, outstanding stuff on this. Uh, we'll have you back on because this issue is never going to go away. It's just going to get worse and worse, I'm afraid. Till we have you back on the show, though, let folks know where they can follow you, what you got going on, and how they can keep track of what's going on in the world of David McGarry. Yeah, please follow me on Twitter at David B. McGarry. Um, also follow my work with Young Voices. You'll find my profile on the website. Um, I'm writing and getting published consistently on privacy issues, on uh, tech and uh, and uh, personal security issues. So I would love to, uh, I would love to get my message out as far and wide as possible. And I can't wait to come back on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Anytime that's McGarry with two R's and an A M C G A R R. And I like them other McGarry's that spell it differently. Make sure you get it right. David McGarry. Great <laughs> stuff today, my friend. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much. Sir.